context in which we started thinking about and, and developing this approach is very much the drama that um, was laid out for us last night by, by Tim Jackson. Um, a global context today of very rapid environmental change involving extremely complex earth and atmospheric and ecosystem dynamics interacting with human action to lead to what many have feared and certainly appeared in 2008 and is ongoing to be interlocked crises. Um, some people like the UK government chief scientist John Beddington has talked about um, has talked about perfect storms of crises involving food and energy and environment. Um, other people like Tim Jackson have talked about this ongoing, ongoing drama of, of interlocked moments and trends, um, often generating some quite unpredictable threats. But I think what we're also seeing is growing scientific and public and political and policy concern about these things. And it's that combination of sort of changes revealed by global science, if you like, and this growing political concern that has given rise to what Sheila Jasanoff punned a few years ago um, as a new climate for society. And possibly we're beginning to think, as it were, a new climate, a new context in which we have to rethink the kind of research we do and the kind of social science we do. So that's one of our starting points. But a second is that society itself, a new climate for which society? Who is it who's going to feel, who is feeling in different ways these, the playing out of this drama, these, these threats, these ongoing crises and changes? Um, our world is, I think, one more than ever one of mobility, of interconnection across shifting social, economic, governance, political landscapes. Um, in which we're seeing both new kinds of political movement emerging and the, 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 the dramatic events around the um, Arab Spring last year, I think, brought those home, but also around which we're seeing inequalities of a number of kinds intensifying and their geography shifting. So, in a sense, we're also in a um, more unequal but also very complexly changing set of social and political landscapes too. And that creates challenges, um, and it's that challenging context in which <coughs> the step centre kind of stepped and is attempting to ask um, our own core question. And this is the core question that we've posed ourselves in the centre. How might pathways to sustainability that link environmental integrity, technology, with social <coughs> justice be built in this highly unequal and highly complex and dynamic world. Now that's a massively ambitious question. Um, it's the question in a way um, of which last night's question about where is the green economy, what is the green economy, is part of. That's a subset of it. Um, but this in a way is a, is a slightly, slightly bigger and broader question. And as we, as I sort of introduced yesterday, we've attempted to work around that question through an interdisciplinary and engaged approach which has brought together perspectives from a wide range of social science disciplines across development studies and science and technology studies, working with natural sciences in certain settings, and, and bringing together the perspectives of partners and producing a kind of iteration between broader conceptual work and very grounded field-based projects of which we'll be hearing more about later. And it's through that kind of iteration that we've been developing this pathways approach, which is, in a sense, our main conceptual offering so far from this iteration. Um, and we sometimes talk about it as a, as a guide to thinking and action around sustainability challenges. It's not a blueprint, it's not a template, it's not a... It could be described as an analytical framework, but, but it's not one to be applied rigidly. It's, it's a set of signposts around things one needs to think about, which perhaps aren't always taken into account in mainstream social science approaches. Um, and as I've said, it's been taken forward in a variety of different ways, which you'll hear about later in, in the morning. Um, the book Dynamic Sustainabilities, which you've each got a copy of, 
um, lays out at this stage, the mo in the most comprehensive way, sort of where we've got to in this pathways thinking. Um, and it's particularly chapter three that covers some of the ground that I'll be talking through in this lecture. So, I've laid out some, as it were, contextual starting points, but we also started um, in the book and started with the pathways approach with a basic problem of mismatch. Now, one often hears talk of mismatches between, as it were, dominant approaches to kind of capitalist economic growth and the kind of collision course with green thinking, with, with approaches to life to policy that might take as it were, other kinds of values and sustainability more seriously. Now, that's actually not the mismatch I'm talking about here. Um, in a sense, I'm already that we're preaching to the converted um, in suggesting that everybody in this room would hold out that sustainability is important. So the mismatch actually is a slightly different one. It's between the kind of business as usual that has emerged and is emerging to address sustainability challenges and emergent understandings of the world um, emerging on the ground and in some other research quarters. And it really goes like this, that we're seeing across a range of social and natural science approaches growing recognition of complexity, of dynamism, of the ways in which social, technological, environmental systems are intercoupled, they're non-linear, they're cross-scale, they involve complex dynamics, they involve uncertainties. There's a massive work in complexity science, <coughs> complex systems thinking, in the social sciences that have engaged with that, and in its popular versions in chaos theory and so on, which, which would recognise those complexities. There is also, at least in some quarters, growing recognition of diverse knowledges and ways of knowing and of values and contested values amongst people and groups across the world. That would be picked up in quite a lot of social science work. It's also become absolutely evident in some of the political and social movements that we've seen over the last few years. Yet, despite that, despite, as it were, that reality which some research is, is revealing, we also see in many quarters a search for far more managerial and technical solutions, um, which kind of don't take account of any of that complexity and dynamism, which, which act as if the world were basically pretty stable and predictable and controllable and manageable. So we see the idea of problems to be solved, risks to be, to be assessed and managed, um, stability, a kind of predictable status quo to be re-achieved. And that mismatch is a problem because what it often leads to, and I think we, we see this in many of our cases across the world, <coughs> is a kind of set of cycles of failure because people try to do these approaches premised on a stable world and actually they don't work because the world isn't like that. So one gets backlashes, either ecologies don't behave as expected or people don't behave as expected and they resist. Backlashes biting back from people, from nature. And very often, the, um, the response from, as it were, those implementing approaches is to see it as an implementation failure, an attempt to implement again with greater force. And that only produces further resistance and backlash. So then you end up with a kind of mire of disagreement. And the problem is that in those mires, it's so often people who are already vulnerable and poor and marginalised who end up losing out. So... That's, is in a sense, a starting point that, that, that we saw in a lot of the work that not a number of us had already been doing prior to the beginning of the Step Centre. And we, we wanted to think about how one would start to, to approach the world and do research and action rather differently. So the Pathways approach attempts to do that. And I'm now going to kind of set out for you a number of building blocks in this attempt to think rather differently. And the first building block is a way of thinking about sustainability. Now, sustainability is a term that gets thrown around a lot, used in a lot of different ways. It's also a term with a history. 
moving from its first use in an environmental context in 1712, I think, was the earliest usage we found um, in relation to forestry, through to the 1980s when it came into much wider currency. And what we had here was the birth of the environmental movement, of course, in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and the debates at that time around limits to growth and so on, when environmentalists were very keen to show how environmental issues could be linked to mainstream questions of economy and economic development. And the commission chaired by Grohal and Brundtland um, in the early 1980s and the report Our Common Future became the sort of focal point at that time for that debate. Um, culminating in the now pretty classic modern definition of sustainable development, which you have here. And from that point, sort of around the 1980s, there was a really huge explosion of academic debate around these issues, which spawned a great many technical meanings of sustainability. So people talked about broad and narrow sustainability, weak and strong sustainability, um, and a whole, a whole range of others. The debate was very vibrant, it was often quite confusing, um, but what it did have within it was competing notions of what sustainability <coughs> ought to be about. And they did sort of compete with each other. But the question on, for many, I think, kind of as the 80s drew to a close and the world began to approach the 1992 Rio Summit, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, now 20 years ago, um, was how would all of this debate translate into kind of practical action on the ground in governments, in places, in, in global settings. And what seemed to happen um, at Rio was actually a loss of much of that politicised content and instead a kind of exponential growth in planning frameworks. Sustainability came almost to be a managerial planning tool, um, which at one level in Rio was all about global agreements, so this is when we saw spawned the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Conventions on Biodiversity and Combating Desertification, the kind of global architectures. And at the other end, Local Agenda 21 with its emphasis on community-based approaches. But sustainability at both ends became a, a kind, of, kind of planning tool. Um, so what we saw was a whole range of analysis frameworks, measurement tools, indicators, audit systems, evaluation protocols and so on, which were supposed to help governments and businesses and communities and NGOs make sustainability real. But these were often quite simplistic and quite managerial and when translated into action on the ground or in the globe, they, they left a great deal to be desired. Many of the Rio targets, as we know, um, went unmet, and many of the ensuing interventions and initiatives that sort of played out over the 1990s and into the 2000s fell foul of exactly that kind of um, downslide of mismatch with real-world dynamism that, that I've described. And that kind of, sort of failure, it's not exactly failure, because many, there were some sort of successes along the way, but that sense of lack of full failure has led to a discrediting of sustainability in many quarters. Um, it's not, and, and some people have said this is actually empty rhetoric, or it's a set of managerial tools that don't work. And yet, sustainability now again is the the catchword for 20 years on, Rio plus 20 next month. So I think we need to ask, and people are asking, will this be more of the same? Or is it time for something slightly different? Um, well, the view that we've taken within the Step Centre is that sustainability hasn't had its day. It's not time to throw it out. We've got it in the title of our centre, for goodness sake. Some people said to us, why have you got sustainability in your title? Sustainability has had its day. We believe no, and that there are clear opportunities now to kind of reinsert this concept into research and action and policy in new ways, but that this requires sustainability to develop <coughs> these managerial pretensions and actually be recognised for what it is as a political term.
And this means moving beyond several things, moving beyond a kind of Oxford English Dictionary definition of sustainability, which if you look it up in the dictionary, simply refers to something like capable of being maintained at a certain rate or level. In other words, inherently conservative and static. You want to kind of keep things the same. That's not what we're talking about. But we also need to move beyond that Brundtland usage, which did have a kind of normative sense of meeting, meeting people's needs and coupling those with, within certain limits. Mm -hmm. But yet those were very, very generalised, um, poorly specified, um, and, and not tied to any particular social, environmental or economic mm -hmm. values. So what we're suggesting is that one needs to go further to distinguish amongst different normative views of sustainability, recognising that there are always going to be multiple sustainabilities which need to be defined quite precisely by and for different issues and different groups of people as related to the particular values, goals, system properties, flows of goods and services that they particularly value. <coughs> so what might this mean? Um, take debates about the green economy and the ways they're trying now to value ecosystem services and produce new policy instruments such as reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation through carbon financing. This is, from one point of view, seen as a route to sustainability um, within a global carbon economy and offsetting, the, in a sense, the high levels of carbon <coughs> consumption in the north with um, forest protection in the south. It could also be seen by many national governments as a route to enhancing and maintaining national forest stocks. But if one looks at what's happening on the ground from the perspectives of some people living around those forests, these same approaches can translate into green grabs where people are actually being kept away from resources that they, that they value. Um, and those groups might actually define sustainability in rather different ways in relation to livelihoods and ongoing usage of forest resources um, in ways that may well be sustainable, but the sustainability lies in the maintenance of system properties that sustain livelihoods over the long term. Or take another example, which will be picked up um, later in the presentation on the Mays project. Um, in the context of climate change related drought, for instance, should the sustainability of, of seed systems and farming systems be defined in relation to national food security? Is that the goal? Or the livelihoods of dryland farmers? Is that the sustainability goal? Or gender justice, perhaps related to women's and men's different crop varieties and control? Now, the point is that all these versions of sustainability are valid in a sense. But they're all different. Um, rhetorical appeals to sustainability often are and can be used to obscure these, these differences um, and to actually kind of write out of the picture these contested interpretations. Um, and so we feel that actually digging beneath that kind of rhetoric and uncovering these particular interpretations and the potential for contestation is actually a key task. And if one does that, Sustainability becomes something rather different. It becomes a sort of contested discursive resource. It becomes a, 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 a concept through which we can begin to generate arguments and discussions and debates um, about diverse pathways to rather different futures. And this brings sustainability rather firmly into quite a different arena, um, the realm of the political, where debates around some other core concepts, something, that, something like justice perhaps, or democracy, or citizenship, have been for centuries, have been since the very beginning of their first usage and discussion. And our suggestion is that sustainability now needs to be recognised as one of these inherently politicised concepts around which we need to have some proper philosophical and moral debate. So, how have we then gone about, as it were, operationalising this kind of view, this politicised perspective in our pathways approach? Well, here 
we've used a kind of system <coughs> heuristic, if you like, um, a representation of the world which doesn't fully account for reality, but we find quite useful to think with. Um, and this would be to recognise that over on the right, all these splodges and, and, um, and blobs, um, kind of acknowledge that the world is endlessly complex and dynamic. In a sense, that's a sort of complex reality, if you like. Yet it's useful for analytical and practical purposes to think in terms of systems. And a system can be thought of as a set of interacting social and technological and ecological elements that, that interact and relate to each other in dynamic ways, in particular environments or contexts. And they move. Systems don't stay still. They're constantly moving and, and transforming in, in, in different directions. But that's not terribly new. What, what the pathways approach does is to add another layer, a reflexive dimension to this kind of heuristic, drawing on a rather different set of analytical traditions, more related to constructivist approaches and traditions of methodological constructivism in the social sciences of the kind that have been part and parcel of the gamut of work in anthropology and certain kinds of sociology or in science and technology studies. And that would be to recognise that there are multiple ways of understanding and representing a system. Um, that is framing. The notion of framing is something you'll hear us talk about quite a lot, and, and that basically means different ways of understanding or representing a system and its relevant environment or context. And all analysis of a system, whether it's by researchers or whether it's by um, people who are living in it or by policymakers, involves framing, inevitably. There is a reality there, but we can't perceive that reality, we can't apprehend it, outside of particular kinds of understandings and, and representations. Um, so framing involves a lot of different dimensions. It involves choices about which elements to highlight, about the scale at which you frame the system, at which, how you bound it. Um, but it also involves much more subjective and value judgments about what the system is doing and why it matters about um, the interests those interactions represent, about the goals that they serve, um, about the values that those imply, and about the notions of relevant experience that, that, uh, that kind of, as it were, pronounce and evaluate those aspects of the dynamics. And the key thing is that these framings are produced by particular actors, particular local people perhaps, or scientific or policy or business actors, um, emerging from, as it were, co-constituted with their own backgrounds, their life worlds, their, their settings. And this serves to introduce a kind of actor orientation um, into work around systems, which often denies that. Um, one sort of critique of systems approaches in the social sciences is that they're, they're, they're kind of, well, to use a technical terms, structural functionalists. They assume that the world just kind of operates and people obey the rules and, and doesn't give much kind of agency or intentionality to real people who think and do and interpret things. And, and our pathways approach, on the other hand, is very much about trying to place those actors, different as they are, centre stage. And where, where they are is here, doing this framing. Um, linked to the ways they are themselves in the system and potentially able to act upon it. So the other concept and building block that you will hear quite a lot talked about in the Step Centre is the idea of a narrative, a storyline. And particular system framings often become part of narratives or stories about a problem or an issue. Um, I'll show you some examples in a minute, but following the work of people like Emery Rowe, as well as um, other work in the social sciences, narratives can be seen as really quite simple stories with, with beginnings and middles and ends, and they're produced again by particular people or institutions. The beginning is, as it were, a starting point. It's often 
a system framed in a particular way, kind of where, where you begin. The middle is a set of envisaged actions that you might um, sort of address and go about putting forward. Um, and the ends would be a particular solution. Now that might be um, a particular future that you desire, it might be a way of averting a catastrophe, sort of heading off a potential crisis or a disaster. Um, but narratives usually have direction within them. They're about changing something to alter that endpoint. And what's often quite critical in them is that narratives are produced by some actors, but they often say things about what other people should be doing. They often construct publics or local people or businesses or corporations or um, governments in certain ways um, as actors who ought to bring about changes, who ought to change their behaviour or amend their ways in some way um, in order to, to contribute to some kind of desired outcome. So let's just look, um, oh sorry, just quickly to, to emphasise, just as framing involves a lot of different practices, so does narrative creation. Um, and as actors, as it were, create their narratives about the world, um, they, they do a lot of different things. They state what the goals might be, they set agendas, they, they um, decide what the context should be, but they also highlight values, they prioritise certain issues while leaving out others, um, and they assign cause and blame and responsibility in particular ways. And, as I've said, the labelling of particular people or groups as responsible or culpable or, or to be blamed is often part and parcel of those processes. So, let's look at a couple of quick examples. Now, this first one... Um, it's going to be picked up on quite directly in the case study that John will present. But um, it might be, if you take a, a, a setting, it's very much stylized, take a setting like um, dry land areas of East Africa, where we have, we often find seed companies, certain plant biotechnology firms, and certain funders and government departments who frame the system and its goals at quite a national scale and produce a narrative which is focused on increasing crop productivity um, towards the goals of, as it were, addressing food deficits in aggregate, a narrative that this can be done through massive boosts to productivity, often involving <coughs> new agricultural biotechnologies. Okay, that's, that's, that's out there as, as a narrative, very much alive and well. But it contrasts with, with some others. Um, and if we look to what perhaps certain farmers or NGOs or researchers and, and social scientists might be saying, one sees alternative narratives that emphasise instead much more diverse, context-specific responses geared towards um, sustainable farming livelihoods as the goal, rather than gross agricultural productivity, and which um, allot responsibility and agency in very different ways. Here there would be an argument that farmers' own perspectives and their knowledge and innovations might have central roles to play. Or let's move to a different case, which I'm going to be using in, in the rest of this talk um, to, to kind of run through some examples. Coming from some of the work we've done around pandemics and pandemic threats. And here we find that a kind of outbreak narrative is often pushed by international <coughs> agencies and governments, particularly governments in northern settings in Europe and America. Um, and this is an exemplar of, of this kind of outbreak narrative as, uh, above. And as you can see, it defines the system very much in global terms and focuses on a particular interpretation of disease dynamics. Um, sudden emergence, often in faraway places, out of Africa or out of Asia, um, with then speedy, far-reaching, often global, global spread, to threaten populations in the north, requiring a particular kind of emergency-oriented response to, as it were, stop the outbreak in its tracks at source. <coughs> 
Um, and this is very much the, the story told in the movie Contagion, which was a recent Hollywood blockbuster, if any of you saw it. Um, it's, it's absolutely the outbreak narrative writ, writ large, but it's also very real. It's also the way that many international agencies, um, such as the WHO or the Centers for Disease Control, are kind of running their narrative and then acting in the world. Um, in contrast, though, alternative narratives, which would be promoted by certain researchers, by some NGOs, by some technical agencies, emphasize a much more localized developmental model um, where the concern is not so much global threat but local public health problems, the fact that um, these same diseases are causing high mortality and basically killing people in local settings. And that the responses ought to include building on the knowledge and the cultural logics and the social protocols that people living with disease have often developed in those settings. Um, and also tackling some of the underlying causes, perhaps in, in transmission dynamics, that make people vulnerable in the first place. And here we see just one example of the kind of alternative solution that would emerge from that narrative. Um, bamboo skirts to protect date palm sap from bat urine. So cutting out a key cause or transmission route of the Hennepa viruses that are picked out in the movie Contagion as the source of global outbreak. And this kind of localised, integrating ecology, animals and people policy response is part of what now are being talked about as one health approaches um, in the disease response arena. But reflecting a very different narrative about what's going on. Now, we'll be thinking in the session on policy processes um, later in the week um, more strongly about the ways that different narratives become part and parcel of policy processes and become supported. But I want now to move on um, to a slightly different and kind of further sort of building block of the pathways approach, which is how questions of system dynamics are treated under different narratives. And as in these examples that I've laid out, albeit rather briefly, Narratives about actions aiming to promote sustainability involve assumptions about, first of all, the nature of the changes that are affecting the system, what we might call their temporalities. Are we talking about short-term shocks, a sudden outbreak, or longer-term, a lot of longer-term changes? Are we talking about short-term droughts or sort of longer-term <coughs> environmental rainfall stresses? And they also make different assumptions about the styles of action that you need to address those. Is the aim to control the drivers of change? Can you actually, can you actually are they tractable to control? Can you, can you actually get on top of them? Or are they less tractable and needing a, a more responsive kind of mode where you just sort of work with what's going on? That's the sort of classic distinction between more control-oriented management and more responsive, adaptive management that one finds in a lot of the literature on social ecological systems, for instance. Um, and this little sort of two by two diagram, um, which we've also found quite a useful sort of heuristic to think with, um, really leads us to ask, within any given narrative, are intervention strategies aimed at exercising control to resist shocks in which case we're up here in the stability corner, aiming to kind of clamp down on those shocks and return to a status quo. Or is there an acknowledgement that actually there might be limits to that kind of control and actually our strategies, our interventions need to be um, responding to shocks in a, rather more, um, in a rather more responsive, adaptive fashion, in which case we might be talking about resilience over in the top right-hand corner. But in other circumstances, as we saw in a couple of those examples, the system may be um, affected by longer run, sort of slower duration stresses, long run shifts. In that case, we might again be talking about interventions that aim to control those shifts, um, in which case we're talking about durability as a, as a property. Or we might be recognising that there's, there are limits again to that kind of control 
suggesting strategies aimed at robustness in, in the bottom right corner over there. Now, these, we suggest, are quite important practical distinctions about what one does in a dynamic systems context that are often elided or, or ignored altogether in analysis for policy making about, about sustainability. We often find the term resilience kind of used in a way that actually covers several of those. Um, or there's an assumption that actually stability is what one's about, when actually that may be quite inappropriate because the, the, the drivers of change are not amenable to that kind of control. So unpacking them, we think, is important because those different properties do suggest very different strategies. So let's just have a look at that in a little bit more detail, going back to this epidemics example. Um, one can see very different um, sort of clusters of strategies associated with those, those different properties. And different narratives would emphasize different bits of the diagram in different ways. So an emphasis on stability is very much the case for those sort of classic outbreak narratives, the contagion type view which, as we've seen, emphasise stamping out short-term disease shocks to kind of return to a status quo. Um, thus, we've seen control-oriented responses of that kind to outbreaks of Ebola hemorrhagic fever in Central and Eastern Africa, to SARS when it emerged um, in, in China and Southeast Asia, which were to some extent very effective. They worked on, they worked on rapid response and containment and public health measures to limit contact and spread. And in terms of simply the goal of stopping the outbreak, they, they were quite effective. But in thinking about a sustainable disease response system over wider areas and longer timeframes, there's also a need to respond to different outbreaks as they might crop up in a somewhat more flexible manner. And a flexible response network that can be positioned to react as and when needed can, in that kind of context, be seen as a strategy for, for resilience. It is, for instance, what um, the World Health Organization's Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, go on, as it's, as it's termed, um, very much tries to do, having a network of NGOs, of scientists, of people in the big agencies ready to mobilise as and when needed. But that kind of response is still very much geared to short-term short -term shocks, as it were, mobilised to hit that particular outbreak. Um, they don't pay very much attention to longer-term stresses, which might be part of the driving dynamics of how diseases arise in the first place and who is vulnerable to them. And um, if one's to take the case of something like Ebola hemorrhagic fever, there are many, many questions which are raised by precisely such longer-term dynamics. Um, so we would need to ask, how might response infrastructures be attuned to responding to longer-term evolutionary changes in the virus, um, or to longer-term shifts in environments and ecology, perhaps linked to climate change, which will affect where outbreaks might arise? Um, all of those things would require perhaps surveillance infrastructures actually attuned to that kind of change, to tracking them and, and responding to them. Um, but that might be geared to attempting to control those changes. Probably going to be quite dubious for many, many of the dynamics we're talking about. So instead on the, on the right hand side, um, we might be wanting to think about strategies for robustness. Um, more flexible infrastructures, more systemic surveillance of drivers of disease as well as outbreaks themselves, um, requiring more cross-sectoral approaches and that kind of one health approach which links the tracking and the response to human-animal interactions as well as simply diseases as they occur. So that's, that's just an example, and I know that epidemics are not an issue that any of you particularly are working on, but it's actually quite useful sometimes to think through a generic exemplar before one begins to think about how any of this might apply to the cases that are more generic to your work. <coughs> 
what one can suggest, I think, is that these four properties of stability, durability, resilience, and robustness might be seen as individually necessary and collectively sufficient elements of sustainability. Sustainable solutions, one could argue, are those that offer stability, durability, resilience, and robustness in relation to a given problem. But, and this is key, going back to our normative definition of, st of sustainability, in specified qualities of human well-being, of social equity, and of environmental integrity. And this is crucial. We're not just talking about sustainability, resilience, robustness, durability in a general sense. We need to ask always, resilience of what? For whom? Stability of what? For whom? What are the goals? Take the epidemics case. The goal might just be, well, the goal might be protecting northern populations from spread. The goal might be um, local public health. Or it might be maintaining the rights to bury dead and move around freely of local populations, rights that are often denied by these short-term outbreak control response strategies. So these are the things we need to bear in mind, and it means that analysis for sustainability is much, much more than just a technical assessment of these properties. Um, we need to ask constantly, what's the system, what's its purposes, for whom? What's to be sustained, and for whom, and why? Who is to define those things, and how? and to recognise that all of those aspects are going to be contested. So, this brings us to what pathways are about, um, and also to a kind, of, a kind of checklist. So, just to recap a bit, for any given issue, it might be an epidemic, it might be something completely different, we might identify an array of narratives, for each of those narratives, we can ask, who are the actors? Who's saying this? Um, what's the specific framing of the system and the goals for change? Um, how are, what different notions are bounding? Um, and what are the goals and values that are prioritized? And which of these dynamic properties are being prioritized in the strategies that are envisaged? Is it focused on shocks or stresses, control or response? Okay, we can look for narratives, but narratives are, of course, important not just as stories about the world. Some of them, at least, justify and become entwined with real changes, particular pathways, and we're now coming to talk about pathways, of intervention and system change. And that's the way we define pathways. Pathways, in a, in a very basic <coughs> sense, are the particular directions in which systems change over time, as shaped by particular kinds of strategy and intervention. And, of course, as multiple narratives about an issue may exist, each of those may suggest different pathways, different ways that the system should be shifted and, and intervened in. But the point is that, in reality, some, only some of these pathways come to be real. Um, some come to exist because real people and actors and institutions do things that bring them into reality. Particular kinds of response to an epidemic unfold. Others, on the other hand, remain sort of in the imaginaries or the desires, perhaps, of different actors. They might remain hidden altogether. They might remain um, marginalised and sort of attempted, but actually don't really get any attraction. Or they might be imagined as possibilities, but don't actually have any, any reality as yet on the ground. The point, though, is that all these pathways, the, the real and the unreal, the alternatives and the dominant, the hidden, the hidden narratives, the potential narratives, need to be, as it were, unearthed and subjected to analysis and consideration and possible debate. And our suggestion is that pathways to sustainability need to be constructed through explicitly addressing these multiple pathways, real and imagined, and the potential contestations and trade-offs between them. Now, 
If one could have a kind of open debate about all of those things, that would be great. But of course the point is that that kind of debate doesn't happen on a level playing field. And in reality, um, some pathways become real and others don't. And in trying to, to get to grips with, that, with that, how that happens, we've been thinking hard about how it is that narratives and pathways become shaped by, as it were, co-constructed with political and institutional processes, which is really a kind of definition of governance. Um, governance broadly means politics and institutions, and critically in our understanding, power and knowledge and the interlocked relationships between power relations and ways of knowing about the world. And it's governance processes in those broad terms which shape which pathways come to dominate and which remain marginal, which become real and act in the world and which don't. And governance processes in practice, we find, often promote and maintain a kind of locking, um, to take a term which comes from science policy and innovation studies, to particularly powerful narratives and pathways, to the exclusion and marginalisation of others. And that's something that we've seen in very many of our cases and that the, the illustrations we'll look at um, shortly from my colleagues will, will draw out. But if governance is so important, how should we be thinking about governance and interrogating it? Well, we've found it productive to engage with the insights in quite a large array of, of literatures and debates. Um, some of which we'll be picking up on in more detail later in, in other summer school sessions, in the sessions on policy processes, in the sessions on transitions, and particularly in the one around institutions next week. There's governance, I mean, different disciplines, different social science perspectives have approached governance in many different ways. But some of the arenas of, of literature, some of the areas that we've looked at and which are talked about to some degree in um, the chapter four of dynamic sustainabilities um, is the shift towards seeing governance as government, something that states do, towards recognizing networked governance involving a whole array of actors and institutions across local and global scales. Governance is something that's done by NGOs, by um, community institutions, by people working in and across the state. There are literatures on participatory governance that we've drawn on. Those which see governance as something that's done in, in practical terms, looking at the actions of particular bureaucrats or state agents or, or frontline workers. Um, and then there's a, a rich literature, which I'm sure that um, many of you, given your backgrounds, are, are, are quite familiar with, around the politics of nature and the politics of technology some of which we'll be, be looking at further in the sessions with Brian Wynn and with Sheila Jasanoff um, later in the summer school. Um, there's work particularly coming from anthropology and, and political sociology, which recognises the importance of political cultures, particular styles of decision-making and of doing politics embedded in histories and, and contexts, which are again an important part of governance. There's work around the politics of knowledge and the way that that especially relates to what Foucault in his work termed governmentalities, um, so that capillary power relations shape and often mould the subjectivities and the, the sense of self of the governed so that they come to, to, to almost govern themselves by, by becoming unreflective about a given social order. And it's often a combination of those analytical strands that we need to bring to bear to understand in any particular setting how it is that lock-in happens and indeed how it might be, might be averted. Um, thinking about that lock-in to powerful narratives and pathways, we've used the term closing down quite a lot and to bring back up this, this two by two diagram, 
we can think about governance processes causing a sort of closing down in two different but related senses. One is towards singular narratives and pathways, particular dominant, powerful ways of understanding and acting that exclude others. But also, in many of our cases, we see that lock-in, that closing down, um, focusing much more on stability, on um, ways of seeing the problem and possible solutions in terms of controlling shocks to maintain a stable situation, leaving these other properties um, unaddressed or underplayed. And this is really what's happening in that contradiction that I started with, that we do have interventions which are very much more about um, seeing the world in terms of a stable situation that can be acted on and, and maintained. And we've seen this in many of our cases. So what is it, if we're to think about governance pressures that lead to that, as it were, shift to the top left-hand corner? Well, um, one can, can see a range of institutional and political processes which tend to encourage that kind of drift. Perhaps most fundamentally, it's almost a, a kind of obvious point that power dynamics tend inevitably to encourage and enable institutions that are already in power to pursue strategies that maintain a status quo which keeps them in power. So there's almost a kind of self-perpetuating self cycle whereby stability which maintains the status, the status quo. There's also... Um, a sense in which a focus on planned equilibrium and stability also relates to quite deeply rooted styles of thinking and action and culture, um, which see balance in human nature relations as, as a normal and desirable state. Um, we see this particularly in, in Western traditions of, of thought about, about nature. But that's also worked its way into a lot of styles of management and theories about managing the environment, whether it's climatic climax theories about managing vegetation or rangelands, or indeed ideas about population, keeping human numbers and um, environmental footprints somehow in balance. Um, but then moving beyond those kind of deeper ideas, there's... There are, it's often the ways in which particular ideas and discourses become embedded in institutional practices, in bureaucratic routines, um, that make them so sticky and so hard, hard to challenge sometimes. Um, they become part and parcel of the way that bureaucrats operate, that institutions work. If um, the WHO's outbreak alert and response model has grown up around an idea of leaping in and controlling short-term shocks, there's a, there's a whole set of institutional practices and histories and bureaucracy that are about that approach. Um, and those ideas in turn, of course, can acquire powerful political economic backing. In the case of diseases, again, to use that example, huge amounts of public cash have been invested in those outbreak narratives and responses, um, bringing financial and economic pressures to bear on implementing them and showing that they work. Um, and then added to those political economic pressures are often professional and disciplinary ones. Um, in the epidemics case, it's often um, disciplinary cultures centred around biomedicine and epidemiology and the kinds of models that they use. Um, which emphasise short-term disease-focused assessments and draw attention away from perhaps those wider concerns with justice or even concerns with longer-term ecological dynamics that some of our other narratives, perhaps those positioned more towards the bottom right, might have emphasised. And finally, through, through what Foucault and, and others would term bio, governmentality and biopower, we often see local populations themselves becoming disciplined into the inevitability of that kind of understanding and, and response, which powerful institutions are, as it were, pushing. So if that's just some examples, very sketchily in a sense, of some of the pressures involved in closing down, what might we do about it? Well, 
we're suggesting that actually one needs to move away from those singular narratives in that top left-hand corner to think about opening up and that meeting sustainability challenges is going to require moving beyond these singular views of a problem and possible solution to recognise a multiplicity of possible sustainabilities and pathways to them, recognising different goals and values and their contestation, and also to move beyond these stability-focused strategies down to that right-hand corner to acknowledge where strategies for robustness, for resilience, are also needed. Um, with respect to sustaining those flows and benefits and meeting the goals that people who are marginalised and poor value. So that involves challenging, very often, the dominant narratives and pathways, those that are in play, as well as highlighting alternatives. And given that, as I said, those alternatives are often rather vaguely defined and often not very clearly articulated, that is a very big challenge and it's a challenge that we've met and that our projects have attempted to meet in very different ways and we'll, we'll look at some illustrations shortly. Um, but opening up is therefore inherently a, a political process and in thinking about and acting on how one does it We've been um, experimenting and reflecting um, with a number of different sort of routes, if you like. One is to um, think about different approaches to governance, um, drawing insights particularly from some of the approaches to deliberative governance, reflexive governance, adaptive governance, um, that are particularly there in some of the literatures on, on social ecological systems. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more in the institutions session next week. Um, but there are also key roles, we think, for what in the Step Centre sort of thematic matrix we call designs, um, appraisal tools, methods and methodologies, um, which we'll be looking at, well, you'll see some examples in some of our case studies shortly, um, and we'll explore some of those um, more closely in the methods and methodology session later this week. But crucially, a politics for sustainability must also involve practical political engagement. And two of the areas that we've been thinking about, and in some projects actually getting involved in either directly ourselves or particularly with our partners, including, include attempting to influence policy processes um, within a conception of these as often not linear and involving a multiplicity of discourses and narratives of actors and of interests. And that's something we'll be looking at in the policy processes session led by Ian. And also addressing the scope for citizen action and engagement, as it were, social movement politics of various kinds. And to think about how micro movements might network up to link into broader pushes for change. And that's a, a kind of area of politics for sustainability and, and innovation that the session this afternoon on the new manifesto will, will address to some extent. And that we'll also pick up in next week's workshop with Brian Wynne, where we'll be looking harder at, as it were, citizenship and, and, and the politics of sustainability. Um, but part of this opening up is also um, reflexivity amongst ourselves, whoever the we are, whatever groups we're working in, on our own positionality and the ways that the assumptions and, and the knowledge making that we do might engage progressively with some of these political processes. Um, Recognising that that might involve confrontation as well as consensus, but that it does require us too to think about the immediate narratives and assumptions that we might bring to bear on an issue and to question some of those assumptions. So I just want to conclude quickly with a, a slide and some reflections um, on the role of, of knowledge making and to just offer some reflections on what we've attempted to do in the, in the Step Centre, um, which is really a broader question about what is social science knowledge for 
um, and how does it relate to wider practices of knowledge making, communication and policy in society. Um, and this is a, a little schema that was proposed by Michael Burroy in his presidential address to the um, American Sociology Conference a number of years ago now in 2005. Um, in which he proposed that there are four distinct types of knowledge making, which he referred to as sociology, but for our purposes we might refer to as sustainability social science or, or something of the kind. And each of these would answer those questions about what kind of knowledge is important and why in very different ways. So one type of knowledge Burroway suggests, and we might suggest, is for instrumental purposes whether it's aimed at informing and solving puzzles for academic audiences, what Burroway refers to as professionalised knowledge, and in a sense keeping debates going and alive, um, or whether to solve problems for policy makers or for practitioners or for groups of activists, what Burroway refers to as policy knowledge making, as it were, geared to and with extra academic audiences. Um, and in recent years, there's been a lot of discussion about how to engage research more effectively with that policy dimension, in a sense, moving <coughs> across the top of this diagram. And that's where much of the discussion about research impact lies. Um, much of the debate about how to do it, um, much of the buzz about how to make research useful, about how to take it out of its ivory towers and, and to make it have value in society. Um, and there have been a lot of investments in the kinds of information services and techniques to enable that to happen, approaches for as it were, getting research into use. But those approaches along the top often fail to problematise exactly the kinds of questions that, that I've been raising this morning about framing and the wider challenges of subjectivity, constructive knowledges in sustainability. And they often slip into the trap of assuming a kind of linear relationship between knowledge here and action there, whereby all you need is sort of evidence to inform or change policy. But as our pathways approach that tries to emphasise, reflexivity and reflection about goals and values actually needs to be central to all these processes of knowledge making. And that brings us down to the bottom half of this diagram pointing to the importance of knowledge making which engages critically with the foundations, the assumptions, the directions of academic research, whatever debate one's in. So this is down, down here. Um, and that articulates this kind of critical knowledge with the public sphere and perhaps encourages and engages with those publics and policy makers in encouraging them to be a bit questioning and self-critical about their assumptions and narratives too. And I think we're suggesting and, and in our work in the Steps Step Centre that actually knowledge making for sustainability needs to encompass in different moments all of these areas with an emphasis on keeping the bottom in view but in different contexts, in different audiences, at different moments being able to move quite nimbly across them. Um, so seen in that way knowledge making, research and the way it's communicated to people who want to do things with it or co-constructed with them becomes very much a part of broader political processes, democratic processes and the politics for sustainability and of sustainability is necessarily a politics of knowledge in which our own research and engagements and critical engagements are very strongly implicated. And one could see this summer school and the fact that you're all here as part of a process of becoming more reflexive about our own, about your own knowledge claims and where they come from and how they might be, might be used in the world and the process that I hope we can engage in collectively over the, the following sessions. So um, that's really it for now, but I would emphasise that we're continuing to develop and elaborate and take forward elements of the Pathways approach, both in our conceptual work and the, the project work and the new project work in phase two. And that what I presented here is only an outline sketch of some of the areas of thinking. 
um, which clearly play out and apply and, and come to have slightly different meanings in different settings as we'll hear shortly. So, so join the debate is, is a very real invitation for you to engage with us and to bring your own insights wherever they may fit at the moment in, in the various sort of building blocks that I've laid out um, in, in helping to make this work in, in really producing the kind of knowledge that can contribute to pathways to sustainability that also bring justice to, to people living.